Welcome to the Greener Grass Podcast from Bluebird Botanicals. I'm your host, Lex Pelger. Today, we head up to Fort Collins, Colorado, where we interview Dr. Avery Gilbert about his work with cannabis and aromas. He has a long history in the world of smells, from animal urine to the perfume industry and now into the wild world of cannabis. He'll talk about his work harnessing the power of the human nose to reliably differentiate the various notes of the cannabis cultivars. We'll put links to his work in the episode notes. It was very enjoyable to sit down with a professional like Dr. Gilbert. He's been interviewed widely, he wrote the book What the Nose Knows, and now he's running Headspace Sensory here in Colorado. So sit back, enjoy the show, and don't forget to smell your bud. This show is brought to you by Bluebird Botanicals to spread education about cannabis and other things on the greener side of life. Bluebird CBD oil comes from farms in southern Colorado and is grown using only water, soil, and sunlight. Go to bluebirdbotanicals.com for more info. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with Dr. Avery Gilbert in his lab. Thanks so much for joining us. You're quite welcome. And so before we get into your work with, with smells and cannabis and things like that, can you tell me a little bit about your interest in science and how that evolved in your life? Uh, I'd always been interested in the outdoors and in uh, nature, wildlife. So uh, I was the nature counselor for the, um, the kids' camps in summer. And uh, when I went to college, my interest was really in animal behavior and evolution and sociobiology, which was happening at that time. And um, the smell angle of it only was, was only incidental, really. I got. Uh, I did a senior thesis at Berkeley on the smell of of rattlesnakes and whether uh, Dipodomys meriemii, which is the, the a kangaroo rat, could smell the smell of their predator lying in wait for them. And it turned out they could. They were terrified of it. <laughs> so uh, went on to graduate school in psychology, intending to do more on animal behavior. Um, but the smell angle kept coming up because it's a big thing in animal behavior. Uh, you you mark your territory with scent. You recognize kin. You recognize your offspring or your parents by sense of smell. Um, all kinds of communication goes on that way. So I was doing that, and then uh, it kind of indirectly ended up at uh, the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia after finishing my uh, PhD in psychology at Penn, and worked on uh, mice. Which there was a strange project going on there. There were two lines of mice that were bred for cancer research, and they were genetically identical except for this one small set of genes involved in the immune response. This is what they test you for when they're doing tissue rejection, so you're going to get a, a kidney transplant or something. But based on this one gene difference, the mice smell different to one another, the two strains smell different, and the, pe- the mice prefer to mate with a different kind. So it's a case of opposites attracting. People at Monell were trying to figure out, well, what's going on here? What is the cue? that enables them to smell the difference. And they were analyzing urine and this and that. And I finally said, you know, can we smell it? They were doing all this elaborate chemical analysis and collecting mouse urine, which, believe me, is kind of a tedious thing. Um, You need very tiny test tubes and a lot of patience. And uh, I said, well, can people smell it, the difference between these mice strains? They said, I don't know. So I said, well, let's test it. And so that was my first human experiment. Until then, I've been a rat person and a mouse person, as we say in the business. That made me a human person. By um, I had blindfolded people and had to sniff um, test tubes of mouse turds and mouse urine. So it was it was gross, but it was kind of fun. And also live mice. We put mice in uh, sandwich boxes with slats cut in them, so everybody could breathe and you could sniff the mice. And as a group, people could easily tell the difference between the two strains. So you know that kind of got me going into this whole. Um, area of human olfaction, human sense of smell. I mean, it's really a wide open field, especially back then. And um, I started doing work there, got recruited by a perfume company. I had assumed I would be an academic all my life, but a perfume company came and offered me large money to start a uh, a human sense of smell research program for them, which I did and uh, never looked back. And so you got to start in sociobiology as it was an earlier time in the field. Um, and then combining that really wild, woolly field with smell, which is just such an unknown, you know, such a wide, wide open field as well. What was it like to be working in these two uh, really almost unknown fields? 
you know, th there's pluses and minuses. I would have been um, bored out of my head if I'd been doing, say, visual research in the retina. You know, everybody's figured out the retina. There's like 10 PhD theses on every single type of cell in the retina for vision research. You know, and I just, that's not my style. I just can't do another brick in the wall. I wanted to kind of strike out into fresh territory, uh, blaze my own trail. So that's the fun part of smell. And, and the fun part of sociobiology, because it's behavior, but it's also evolutionary theory and experimental, um, the trouble is it, you end up being interdisciplinary, and therefore you don't fit in one academic department or another. And that can be a problem if you're looking for jobs or looking for a very kind of easily managed reputation. So, I, you know, I, I have no regrets about that. I like doing what I do, especially as a freelance scientist, you can just chart your own course, and that's much more my style. So the that industrial attack that you took really did make sense. Well, it was great for me because I learned all about how perfumery works, how perfumers work, how fragrance evaluators work, how the business works, um, the role of creativity, and it got me started on a whole set of experiments um, that turned out to have kind of started a subdiscipline in psychology. So, for example, we it's very tough to get people to describe odors or perfumes, especially when you're asking consumers what they like and don't like. And so I said, well, maybe there's just some way around that. Let's, let's use not words, but um, colors, say. Can we describe smells synesthetically with, with colors? And so I developed some easy ways to have people match smells to colors. And this turned out to be um, easy to do. You got very reliable results. And it was useful to the business because you could, among other things, tell your client what kind of colors they should use in the packaging or the juice of a perfume. And, um, and yet it was a nonverbal way of describing smells. And this whole thing between, of a kind of cross-modal, it's called, it's just fancy, it's kind of, you know, the relations between hearing, touch, smell, and so forth, it's become quite a field now. And, uh, you know, in a way, I kind of helped get the ball rolling many years ago with those, with those studies, purely out of venal commercial interest. And so what did you start to learn about how, synesthesia and how these other senses are affecting the, the smell sense that you were interested in? Well, it goes both ways. Um, uh, the smell can affect and be affected by the other senses. So we found, among other things, that people have reliable color impressions of smells. They have reliable auditory pitch impressions. So perfumers are always talking about top notes and bottom notes. And it turns out that materials um, typically regarded as top notes, are matched by people to high-pitched notes on a keyboard and other, others to lower notes. So that perfumer's metaphor of notes actually has a kind of reality in a sort of synesthetic way that most of us have. Um, you know, recently with another client, I just published a paper on color and emotion. And you give people emotion words like anger or happy or I feel happy, I feel angry, and uh, give them a, an iPad and an endless color spectrum. They can just doodle around with their finger on the, on the iPad and pick any color possible. You get very reliable color impressions matching the emotions. So it's like, you know, might be verbally mediated. It uh, might reflect some deeper wiring in the brain, but um, it, it's... It's a kind of reliable, natural history of sensory perception. That's what that's the part I like about it. And speaking of the history of it, you're a, you're an author about this subject. What made you decide that it was it was time to to finally buckle down and do the work of a book? Uh, well, I'm always being asked questions. I'm always happy to explain the basics of the sense of smell, the science of it, and. Um, I become frustrated with the kind of books that were out there because they were all old. They were stale. You know, a lot had been done recently. Um, and then I got, uh, actually I got ticked off and that's what started me going. Uh, there was a book called The Emperor of Scent, which was a kind of uh, laudatory, you know, lick job about this guy, Luca Turin, who's got an oddball theory of how smell works. And I, uh, I reviewed it for Nature Neuroscience and you know, I hated it. I just couldn't stand the damn thing. And um, I thought, I can do better than this. We need to tell people what, you know, regular, um, widely accepted smell theory is and how it works. And uh, yeah, I found myself an agent and got some offers. And it only took four years to do, but it was worth it. 
um, I enjoyed doing it. And I, I think it's uh, it forces you to organize your thoughts and also how you know how to reach out to the to the public, which I think is really the um, obligation of a scientist. Uh, what kind of feedback did you get then? Uh, pretty positive. I got uh, sh- shortlisted for an LA Times Book Prize as well as won uh, Royal Society um, uh, Science Prize in England. Um, good feedback, and I, you know, to this day, I keep bumping into people who say, "Oh, that book got me so going, got so much." But you know, and it's just music to an author's ears. But uh, it's 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 very gratifying when you hear people um, uh, tell you that it really that you kind of got through to them and got them inspired. Yeah, and it, it's so rare. I mean, there, for the scientist mentality of, of solo lab work, it's not many who can be a good communicator and get the ideas across to, to students and lay people. You know, very true. Um, I credit that to my time as a postdoc and faculty member at the Monell Chemical Census Center. When I was there, the founder of it, Morley Care, was um, insistent that everybody learn to kind of describe their work, because we had, we had both uh, government grants from NIH, NSF, so forth, and we had corporate sponsors. Big companies were interested in taste and smell. And they would visit the corporate sponsors, and we'd kind of, kind of um, describe to them what we were doing. And he made it a point to sort of tell you how to get your point across. And uh, at first, it was like an annoying, you know, I'd, I'd hear him walking down the hall talking to some sponsor, and then a knock at my door, my office door, and I, Dr. Gilbert, can I introduce you to Robert Mondavi? <laughs> and I turn around, there's Robert Mondavi with his bow tie and his assistant. It's like, yeah, okay, you can introduce me to Robert Mondavi. Um, but it was it was fun, and uh, I think that was a that was a formative experience. And I, I have to credit Morley and the Monell people with uh, kind of getting me on that path, and not the one of the closeted scholar who doesn't want to talk. And so th- those skills helped as well, because you went on to found some startups as well around this world. Um, <laughs> how, did, how did those go, and how did this communication help there? Uh, well, that came to me. I was at a scientific meeting, a taste and smell meeting in, uh, that we have every year in Florida, and a couple of guys came up and introduced themselves. turns out they were the guys that founded Digisense, where they were in the process of creating that company. And um, that's how I got involved in that first one. It's kind of at the turn of the century the peak of the dot-com boom and they wanted to bring smell to the internet with a little device that would plug into your computer and be activated uh, by code basically with action on the screen or clicks or whatever and that was quite interesting disappointing in the end but um, kind of I kind of got the entrepreneurial bug from that later on I started my own smell tests that I sold to doctors using kind of peel-off smell tech- technology like you get in magazines. Rather than scratch and sniff, which is kind of the primitive version of that, you can peel it off and you can get much nicer renditions of, of smells. So that was a little checkbook-sized thing that a doctor could use as a kind of quick smell test in the office. Done that, started my own company as an con- independent consultant when I left the perfume corporate world. And um, I've consulted with other people starting up companies and then start my own most recently, started a company here in Colorado called uh, Headspace Sensory, which is uh, devoted to exploring the smell of the different strains of cannabis, among other things. And before we get to that one, uh, just a little bit on uh, how would it be helpful for a doctor to have a smell test? What would they be testing for in somebody? Doctors routinely do cranial nerve tests, you know, check your hearing, your eyes, your reflexes. So smell is the first cranial nerve and they have ready ways of doing everything else eye test hearing and so forth but for smell you have to have you have to give somebody a smell a kind of standard smell and a standard um delivery and ask them a standard question about it and that's just i mean in the old days people doctors used to like you know hold up a cigarette butt <laughs> you, you actually see that in the literature or an ashtray or an old coffee cup or stuff you know none, none of which would be viewed positively today so uh, it can be helpful, especially when you're looking at uh, the, the two major ways that people lose their sense of smell. One is upper respiratory tract infection, head cold, flu, and the other um, is uh, head injury. So anytime you get a concussion, blow to the head, you can sever many of the tiny little nerve fibers that are going from the nose up through the skull, and that can, that can reduce your smell. So you want a quick check on that, basically, and you know you need something at hand in the in the exam room. 
smells unique in one way that it doesn't have the higher level processing that the other senses have. Like the eyes, you have these processing centers that cut out the information, but the smell sensory neurons go directly into the cortex. Is that about right? Yeah, well, what, they, what smell does not do is go through the thalamus, which is what all the other senses do. So it's, it's got this, um, it goes directly to other centers, you're quite correct. Uh, it goes to the hippocampus, which is a little area that uh, helps form memories. And it goes to the amygdala, which is involved in kind of quick judgments about good, bad, friend, foe, you know, tasty, yucky. Um, and only after processing those areas does it go up to the cortex where we finally say... Um, recognize what it is, or identify it, or make judgments about it. So, in a matter of milliseconds, you're you're saying your your brain is detecting a smell and already saying, "Yeah, <laughs> this is negative," and um, cut off the breath, avert your head, bail out, or you know, mm, "This is good, tasty." Have another sniff. Maybe you know, is dinner ready? Is the pie cooked? Whatever. Uh, and then only. A second or two down the road, are you, do you actually recognize what the smell is? Um, like, is the pie burnt? <laughs> is the uh, is that skunk in the same room? You know, all those kind of things uh, are cortical, higher level uh, mental processing. So yeah, it's uh, we're learning more about that now, and the rise of MRI brain research. You know, me- uh, brain imaging has helped that in the last ten twenty years. So it really makes sense that smells are so good at listening memories because of the hippocampus aspect and then the fear response because of the amygdala. Yeah, or the love it, hate it. Yeah, so the emotional, the emotionality of it and the memorability of it uh, makes sense if you look at the, at the wiring chart, if you will. And so how does that relate to cannabis then and people's experiences with cannabis? Well, so I got into the cannabis thing because I've been three years in Colorado. I actually came out and I was here a year and I was looking around for opportunities locally. One of them was cow manure that, that didn't pan out, but not for any bad reason. Um, the other was cannabis. And I realized people were talking a lot about the smell of the different strains, uh, whether indica and sativa have a different aroma, whether, um, you know, and, and there were these descriptions of smell that you could find on the internet. Um, sort of like wine tasting notes, except not really um, consistently done. So I was fascinated by the fact that, you know, w- what is diesel? And is skunk really a thing? Um, in, and in other areas of smell and taste, we have the, the wine aroma wheel from UC Davis, you know, which has most of the flavors that you'll find in any kind of white or red wine. Uh, other people have done these kind of wheels. So the coffee people, the tea people, they have them. And I thought... Nobody's really doing this, and yet we're having things like cannabis cups and judging competitions, and yet there isn't a standardized way to describe the aroma. And so I visited a few dispensaries locally, and just, you know, everybody's friendly. <laughs> so you ask the smell, and you, they'll hand you one sample after another. And I was just amazed by the range of smell difference from strain to strain. I mean, it's, it's bigger than anything in wine or beer, even with all the crazy uh, flavors that are coming through with the microbrew um, revolution. You get everything from um, grapefruity, lemony, to skunky, musty, uh, woody, herbal, um, sometimes fruity notes, sometimes cheesy notes. So um, I wanted to try to get a grip on that. And nobody had done it. Nobody's ever, all the papers published on weed are about chemistry. You know, so what is, you know, they'll they'll take uh, air samples around uh, dried flour and analyze it. And you keep coming back with a lot of terpenes. This is no surprise. These are common botanical uh, volatile molecules that are, contribute to the smell of everything from citrus fruit to up and down the, the food chain. But nobody had ever tried to put sensory descriptions on it. So that's what got me going. That was the challenge. So bringing the psychology together with these tiny little molecules. Yeah. Well, and bringing kind of standard consumer research techniques um, to cannabis, which hadn't been done. Uh, Mainly because, I mean, there are these, there are big national um, outfits that do consumer research. You know, if you're putting out a new brand of scented candle for Estee Lauder or a new air spray for um, SC Johnson, they'll... You do consumer tests. You ask, and there are ways to present the smells to people, ask for their opinions, and just standard methodologies. But those companies haven't touched it because 
They're located in Illinois and Texas and places where it's not legal. And similarly, there's um, no academic research on the issue for the same reason. You can't you can do it if you get a DEA license and are not are only using government research money. You can't use an, um, an investor's money, and you have to use government weed, which is <laughs> marijuana grown at a plantation at the University of Mississippi. I'm not making that up. That's the official source for all uh, government um, sourced weed, and um, it's by all accounts kind of. 1970s era stuff. Well, I've heard they're up to 5% THC now. Woo! Maybe even 6%. <laughs> yeah, they're trying. Look, I mean, the fellow that started it, um, uh, El Suli is his name, uh, he, he started uh, doing chemical analysis of the volatiles in, in cannabis, and that's fine. And he needed to get his own kind of standardized sample, so they let him grow some stuff there. But he's not a cultivator. He's not, a, he's not part of the industry. And uh, so these beautiful, gorgeous, keefy buds <laughs> that you can get anywhere in Colorado that are just reeking of, you know, it's like a big fruit salad or something. I, I, I doubt you're going to get that there. It's just his growing conditions, his um, his strains. But maybe it's not as bad as the horror stories I've heard. It's it's like, yeah, it might be that bad, like back in the 70s when people would clean up the weed on, t- on a record album cover. <laughs> get the seeds and stems out. <laughs> yeah, there are still seeds in it. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and so you're in a pretty sweet spot here, being in Colorado and being in an industry that a lot of the big players won't touch. It gives you a good niche. And so how does it work with people coming here and and the learning, the experiments you do with them? Well, I had to organize that from a dead stop because I had hoped to work with people at um, CSU at Colorado State University here in Fort Collins. Um, but they're all handcuffed by the federal rules. If a university takes $1 of federal grant money, they have to play by federal rules, so nobody could work. Uh, I did find um, Joseph DeVerdi, who's a chemist at CSU, but he also has a private lab, and that gets, you know, so he could do what he wants in the private lab. I have my own company, Headspace Sensory, and um, so we got a, if you want to publish anything on human perception or human response, you have to get it ethically reviewed, and so we got that ha- got that done, and then I just ha- invited people to come into the lab here, um, which turned out not to be so easy. I was trying to hand out my little leaflets with their approved text, inviting people to come and sniff um, cannabis and give an opinion, and I'd walk around Fort Collins and try to hand these out. People would just jump away from me. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a normal, average-looking guy. I mean, it's a good thing this is a podcast because I really need a haircut right now, but... Uh, some people would be very positive about it. Other people just wanted nothing to, they didn't want to hear about it. As soon as they heard marijuana or cannabis, they literally would jump away. I left brochures at every tattoo parlor, head shop, dispensary in town. And I was getting a little trickle of people. Um, finally got a fellow who had seen one of my flyers. And the only reason he did was that he, he's a, he promotes for concerts here in town with the college crowd, and he's always checking out the competition. So turns out he was willing to help me. He put uh, put a post on his Facebook page, and within an hour I had 30 people lined up for the test. So it's like I found my people, <laughs> and thanks to him. Um, but it took some doing. Now I know Now I know how to connect. Are you still looking for participants? Uh, yeah. Um, actually, I'm probably going to start within the next month another series of tests. But I'd, uh, people would come in. So basically, you you come in, um, you know, give me some your basics about yourself. And then uh, I sit behind a little screen at a table. You sit on the other side. And I hand you out a little glass jar, a little amber-colored bottle. And uh, you sniff it. And then, in this case, just I give you a ballot, a paper ballot. And it's got a lot of smell words, like diesel, cheesy, lemon, raspberry, coffee. And you tick off each word that you smell. Check all that apply. So it couldn't be simpler, you know. So people would sniff and check through, and then I'd give them another jar, and they'd keep doing that. And um, I assemb- I got these smell words from the Internet, basically. I scraped the Internet, all the kind of weed sites. Um, you can imagine. I mean, everything from High Times, Leafly, different uh, dispensaries. So I got just a boatload of words and um, didn't really edit them. I wanted to see what people would think because I didn't know what the right words would be. That's not my place. I'm, I'm drawing opinions from the, 
the consumers in this case. And so clear pictures emerged very, very quickly. Clear pictures for individual cultivars? Yep. So I looked at it around, uh, I think I had 11 strains the first time. Um, and I statistically analyzed them. And it turns out there's two groups. You can do something called cluster analysis. And basically it, it groups similar things, you know, similarly rated items next to each other and different ones elsewhere. So there were two big groups. The one group was strains that smelled sweet, citrusy, and pungent. The other group smelled woody, herbal, um, earthy. Now, you know, within there, there's some, some differences, but that's the big divide. It's uh, very easy to see. Um, people are also very, first of all, they found this test very easy to do. Um, you know, it's not a crazy thing to ask people, you know, does this, do these buds smell lemony? It's, a, it's an often a yes, but it's a yes, no question. It makes perfect sense. Uh, it's also, people are also reliable. I took one bud, split it in half, and put it in two different jars. So they were getting it twice. You know, they didn't know that. Um, and the results, uh, you could lay over the results from the one version and the other version. Very close. Um, and I did, I did another check, just to check reality. You get, you know, if you get lemon diesel or whatever the strain might be, the dispensary is labeling it that way. I don't know what it is, really. There's no real test out there to, to, you know, what is the definition of lemon diesel? Is it genetic? Is it chemical? Is it, who knows? So I got lemon diesel. Uh, actually, I got one strain. Might not have been lemon diesel, um, but from two different dispensaries. And then I compared the results of those two samples, and they were very, very similar. So both at a individual level, people were very reliable in their answers. And also at the kind of commercial level, whatever you're getting that people are calling lemon diesel, let's say, tends to be similarly smelling. So there's some consistency in the market out there, which is kind of good to know. But I had to establish that scientifically. I actually just saw Dr. Raber of the uh, workshop, and uh, he did a lot of analysis of the strains and the terpenes in them. And he said the main thing he realized is, will the real OG Kush please stand up? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it's one of the most mislabeled out there. And you just... You never know what it is, what you say it's going to be. Well, it could be. I mean, that would be another interesting way to go would be to uh, purchase a lot of samples labeled OG Kush and look at the variability within, you know, so w that's that's something I'm hoping the company, my company, Headspace Sensory, can do is to kind of define the envelope, the sensory smell envelope for each strain because there's going to be variability. It's a natural product. It's like, you know, apples. You can have a Macintosh apple and some will be a little sweeter or less or a little tart or crunchier, or softer or whatever, but... Generally, they'll be within this range of spec specifications and still be recognized as a Macintosh or a Granny Smith. So in the same way, you'd, you'd hope and expect that uh, you know, OG Kush has some kind of sensory boundaries. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if some strains have larger, you know, more poorly or wider defined boundaries than others. Some, you know, I, I'd expect there to be difference there. And OG Kush might be one of those ones that just kind of has a very elastic definition. Or maybe there's one kind of smell trait that's that people are really keying in on when they call it OG Kush or Kush type. And so that's one of the things that you hope to offer the industry is reliable smell tests like this, like research groups do for all these other consumed goods. Yep. Yep. So I can, I can put accurate, um, consumer perception numbers on on a particular cultivar um, if you're looking to replicate that impression in say a vape fluid or something else we can help make sure that that fluid is giving the same sort of profile aroma profile and sensory impression as the original cultivar underlying it so you know there's a product format version the same thing we do in the perfume industry if you have you know um, an Estee Lauder perfume and you want to have a soap version of it or a powder version of it, you know, you got to make it smell the same, and it might take a little different sensory engineering or formulation to smell the same across different product bases. So that's one thing. Um, and I think the other thing is just the marketing creativity. Sooner or later, branding is going to come to this business. It's not really here now. I mean, you've got Willie Nelson and Lucinda Williams and um, the Marley brand, but once the scale's up, people are going to expect that a brand has, you know, smells, tastes, smokes, and gives the same um, psychoactive uh, response, you know, from one time to another, 
from one pack to another. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the critical thing to building brands is building that kind of consistency of product. And in order to do that, you need to measure what your product is, you know. So, you know, in tobacco, Marlboro's had one kind of smell and flavor. In tobacco, one kind of blend of, of you know, Burley and Virginia and Turkish tobacco. Camel had another. Uh, Coke has one kind. Dr. Pepper has another. You know, you want to define those profiles and be consistent. So I think... Um, the kind of services I'm offering will help in that when it becomes scale up time, which is, I think, soon upon us. And what other services uh, do you hope to offer in the future to this growing industry? Well, uh, to the creative part, I mean, comes with branding the idea of, you know, who's your audience? I think, you know, I say it's not as a knock, but I think, um, but as I mean, somebody who grew up in the 60s and 70s, uh, I think it's still kind of a hippie industry um, a bit. And uh, if you go to a lot of dispen- dispensaries, vary, but a lot of them still are sort of tie-dyed T-shirt, um, bearded um, nose ring people telling you um, about the product, which is cool. I mean, that's how you show as a bud tender that you are authoritative right now. But the market's going to have to grow out of that um, and appeal to larger audiences, older audiences, um, more urbane audiences that are, you know, buying high-priced wines and and whiskeys, they're going to be interested in this at a different level of conversation. So we've got to move to that. And um, when that happens, brands will need to design themselves to appeal to consumer segments. And that's where I come in, because that's something I've been doing for, you know, 25 years, uh, is helping brands um, define their sensory appeal and to and maximize it for a particular audience. And so what would you love to see in the future on the consumer side for how to really enhance and treasure the smell of this plant? Because it is such a special one. It is. It's a very cool thing, and it's got a whole culture with it, and that's a good thing. What I'd like to do is see the the conversation about cannabis become more, um, more a little more precise and a little more... I don't know, yeah, elevated, I guess might be the word. In other words, it, it, cannabis has just as much olfactory diversity and um, interest as, as wine and coffee and beer. So let's bring it up to the same level. I mean, right now people are a little bit inarticulate about it, and that's fine because we don't have the words. So I'd like to see the, the vocabulary established and consistently applied. Um, I'd like to see, you know, aroma and tasting notes that are interpretable. So, you know, in the same way you go to a, you go to a wine, <clears throat> excuse me, you go to a wine shop and there are hand cards telling you, you know, this is a Zinfandel with a lot of deep, inky, raspberry, so forth. Well, you kind of know what you're getting into. In the same way, I think people want to know what, what to expect and, once, and know what they like. They kind of, they know what they like, they might not be able to describe it. If you help them be able to describe it, then they can find their way to um, satisfactory product. It does sound so much more warm than a list of terpene profiles that you don't quite get. The idea of human selected words. You know, this this the terpene thing is an interesting one. Um, it it's very much like the perfume industry, where we've had this problem for for hundreds of years. There's kind of in my book, What the Nose Knows, I talk about the two voices of the perfume industry, one of which is kind of marketer's voice, which says, oh, this new fragrance is for today's active woman who's outgoing and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's kind of all this um, airy um, fantasy characterization about the consumer. The, so there's that voice. The other voice is ingredient voice, which says, oh, this new perfume has ylang ylang and upper notes of... Uh, you know, cassis blossom and blah, blah, blah. It's like stuff like, who has ever smelled Ilang Ilang neat? Nobody has, except if you're in the industry. No civilian has. And it means nothing, but it's accurate, but it's it just doesn't help. It doesn't help a consumer. So I think um, it's the same bind that uh, cannabis is in right now. We need, we need to get some words, first of all, and we need to get off the, the pure chirping thing. And unless we're all chemists, that doesn't help you. And besides, if I give you a list... It's like perfume. If you can give me the formula for Chanel 5, and if I change one ingredient by 2%, it's going to smell entirely different. So 
it, knowing a terpene profile is like, yeah, maybe, okay, that'll give me a general idea, maybe, but if I tweak a little bit of it, or the natural variation in growing or strain or processing, you could have something smell noticeably different. So I think, I think we need to kind of unhitch the wagon from just the pure chemical terms and get a little more on the sensory side. And that'll connect us, you know, it'll be the bridge between the pure chemistry and the kind of... Uh, branding language that we'll get to eventually. So if anybody wants to come help you out, they're uh, welcome to, to check out your website and come volunteer. Yep. There's a, there's a form they can fill out on headspacesensory.com. And uh, yeah, be happy to see you. Great. And so the book is What the Nose Knows, The Science of Scent in Everyday Life. And you also write on your blog, firstnerve.com, about these uh, topics as well. Yeah, I've been writing about weed a bit there. I'm starting to fire that up a bit more. Uh, Twitter, which I also do as Science of Scent, you know, you're kind of limited there. And it's like pea shooters going at each other. I like the long form a little bit. So yeah, firstnerve.com is there for, uh, for the longer versions. Okay, so we'll put all these links into the episode notes. And uh, Dr. Gilbert, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you, Lex. It's great. Greener Grass is a Bluebird Botanicals podcast. Their CBD oil supports a healthy body and a strong endocannabinoid system. They've got friendly customer service who can answer any of your questions, and the number is right there at the top of their webpage. But per the FDA, they won't be able to make any medical claims for these nutritional supplements. That's also the reason you'll hear little about CBD on this show. There's no need for us to add more evidence about CBD when a simple Google search will give you more than you can read in a month of Sundays. So this show covers the cannabis world and more with editorial freedom from Bluebird Botanicals. Thanks for joining the Greener Grass Podcast. As always, our audio alchemist is Matt Payne, the Gypsy Jazz theme music comes from Brett Van Donsel. Our beautiful bird sounds are courtesy of Lang Elliott. And I'm your host, Lex Pelger, wishing you a bright green day.